human nature at its best. There's a basic belief that goes around unquestioned and that seems to be very fundamental to the way most of us relate to each other. And that belief is that human nature is in some innate sense corrupt, selfish and evil. And that if human beings are not controlled, supervised, disciplined and told what's good and what's bad, they will naturally do more harm than good. Now this belief is somewhat justified because in our own everyday lives, we see so many examples of human wickedness, so many instances of human limitations that it becomes difficult to believe in the intrinsic human capacity for goodness. Even if we believe in such goodness, we think it's something additional, the result of training, of effort and asceticism, or accumulation of years of knowledge. We do not usually think that such goodness is something natural, something essential to the core of every human being. But here is something that will surprise you. After decades of research into human psyche, psychologist Abraham Harold Maslow discovered that the opposite is the case. That is, human nature in its natural, essential and fundamental state, good, loving, courageous and noble. And the so-called bad, neurotic, self-limiting behavior is in truth secondary, additional and acquired. That is, it's not essential to human nature. Maslow discovered that psychologically healthy individuals, when left to their own agencies, naturally tend to exhibit characteristics that are associated with what we usually call good human beings. And as a corollary, psychologically unhealthy individuals tend to exhibit what we usually call selfish, neurotic and self-sabotaging behavior. The reason, therefore, why majority of human beings exhibit neurosis and a weakness of character is because despite of our material and technological advances, a large share of human population is still not psychologically fulfilled. Psychologically, a majority of human beings are starved and undernourished. What is considered normal human behavior in our world is actually an inferior state of being human, a half-baked humanness as it were. In this episode then, we will see what it really means to be psychologically healthy and the possible reasons why so few people ever reach that goal. There's a growing amount of talk about mental health these days. I see a lot of campaigns around this subject trying to make people aware that mental health is a thing, is something real. Now while it's good that there's a greater acceptance of this malady, I'm sure that people in general are not quite aware of the true scale of this problem and understand how rare true mental health really is. Abraham Maslow estimated that in the current state of the world, less than 1% of human population is able to attain true psychological fulfillment. Think about it. Now to understand why that is the case, we will first need to understand what the term psychological health really means. But before we begin doing all that, I want to acknowledge that the findings in this episode are based on Maslow's decades of brilliant work on human psychology and the reason I chose his work is because firstly, it has great parallels with spirituality and secondly, because I wanted to present a better, more clear picture of human nature that is based on research rather than hearsay or opinion. So what does it mean to be healthy? The term health is often used ambiguously. Is it possible, for instance, to distinguish a healthy tree from a sick tree, a healthy lion from a sick lion, a healthy bird from a sick bird, and likewise a healthy human from an unhealthy one? If you think about it deeply enough, you will inevitably come to a conclusion that to be healthy 
simply means to be oneself, to be fully expressive of one's natural capacities, to grow in accordance with one's own nature. A tree that is incapable of growing leaves is probably sick. A lion that is incapable of roaring or hunting is probably an unhealthy lion. A bird that doesn't sing or chirp is probably a sick bird. And similarly, a human being that is not fully human, not fully himself, is likely a sick human being. In usual terms, when we talk about sickness or unhealthiness, we usually mean physical and physiological illnesses. But that is not the subject of our discussion in this episode. Maslow identified that there are other kinds of sicknesses as well that are equally debilitating to the full functioning of a human being. And these inner sicknesses, more often than not, are not addressed or given proper attention. Just like a person, for instance, when deprived of necessary vitamins, exhibit certain deficiencies, there are certain psychological and spiritual needs that when a human being is deprived of, his growth gets stunted significantly and his behavior becomes self-limiting and self-sabotaging. That is, he himself begins to choose things, choose experiences that are not ultimately good for him. What it means is that you yourself will fuck up your life if you do not get the right kind of inner fuel. Isn't that interesting? So what then, you may be wondering, are these needs? Well, on the surface level, we are all quite different. There are at least some fundamental things that we all need. Maslow discovered that these needs are present in human beings throughout the globe, irrespective of their culture or nationality. The Basic Needs Just like a plant requires sunlight, water, air and minerals to grow into a healthy plant, human beings also need some basic nourishment both physical and psychological, to grow into healthy and mature individuals. Unlike plants, however, Maslow discovered that human needs are hierarchical. That is, there are certain basic needs, and when they are satisfied, new higher needs emerge. And when they are satisfied, yet even higher needs emerge, and so on. Now, a person is not usually conscious of these needs, but act out on them nonetheless. So let's take a brief look at what these needs are. The most basic of these basic needs are physiological needs, that is, the need to eat, to drink water, to sleep. Without the satisfaction of this need, nothing else works. If you didn't have enough sleep or did not have enough food to eat this week, you would not have been listening to this podcast. Unfortunately, a significant number of people in our world still struggle to satisfy even this need. Their life exclusively revolves around getting their daily bread and as a consequence, they are psychologically thwarted and underdeveloped. The next on this hierarchy of needs is the need to be safe. Now this is also quite basic and something that we usually take for granted, but it's important nonetheless. Right now, you are sitting comfortably at your home. If you were instead living in life-threatening circumstances, a large share of your attention would naturally be occupied in the purpose of seeking safety. The thought of listening to this podcast would not even have occurred. The next on this hierarchy is the need for love, for belongingness, for intimacy. Now this need is seen to emerge after the physiological and safety needs are not an issue anymore. That is, you have a life of basic sustenance. Now you long for love, for community, for belongingness. This doesn't necessarily mean romantic love. It could also be familial love, love of friends, of community. Note that the higher up we climb this hierarchy, the rarer its need gratification is observed in human beings. That is, the need for love and intimacy is much less gratified in general as compared to safety and physiological needs. It is already likely that some of you listening to this podcast do not have adequately satisfied love and belongingness needs. And the last of these basic needs, which is usually seen to emerge after all the previously described needs are taken care of, is a need for self-esteem or self-respect. Self-esteem is essentially the need to see and feel ourselves as good, respect-worthy individuals. It is the conviction that our life and our well-being are worth acting to support, protect and nurture, that our happiness and personal fulfillment are important enough to work for. To not have self-esteem is to not have confidence in one's own choices, to believe 
that one is in some basic way flawed, incapable and undeserving of the best that life has to offer. Due to many social and cultural factors, the self-esteem need is usually ungratified in a lot of people and can work to limit one's growth if not worked upon. You're not going to be able to expect a great future for yourself for instance and work upon it seriously if you secretly hate yourself and have a fragile sense of self. All right, so these are what Maslow describes as the basic human needs. I want to mention here that these basic needs are not gratified once and for all. They're always present, but usually as a person matures, he learns to take care of them in such a way and to such an extent that he doesn't even have to think about them. Just like for example, you don't have to worry about whether you will get food tomorrow or whether your loved ones will turn against you. Now that you're accustomed to these needs, we can finally move onwards to describing psychological health. One of the key things that Maslow discovered was that psychologically healthy individuals do not live to satisfy these basic needs. That is, their basic needs are gratified on a consistent basis. They have managed to create a life of a lucky enough to be born in a social environment that supported the gratification of their basic needs. And now their life is revolving around something else entirely. When the person therefore is not living for food, for safety, for the need of love, for the need of self-respect, his life becomes less and less about himself and more and more about something that is beyond him. Such individuals are observed to be more mentally stable, less neurotic and less selfish. After this stage, it becomes rarer and rarer to find people suffering from depression, meaninglessness, addictions or any other form of self-sabotaging behavior. Psychologically speaking, such individuals are therefore considered healthy. But it's considered psychological sickness by this definition is to have one's basic needs unfulfilled. That is, if your life revolves around seeking love, seeking intimacy, seeking self-respect, then you're not going to feel psychologically fulfilled. That doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to work on these needs. You can go out on a date for instance, find a community of people that resonate with you, work on your relationships, do some therapy or some personal development work to fix your self-esteem issues. All of these will be helpful if the fulfillment of these needs are yet a priority in your life. The thing that really gripped me to Maslow's research, however, was his discovery that the growth of the person doesn't really stop here. Maslow discovered that in such psychologically healthy individuals, a yet higher set of needs emerge. These he called meta-needs. Now these meta-needs are different in nature from the basic needs. The basic needs are transactional and are satisfied only through the interaction with the environment, with the society. This is why there is a dependence on the world for their satisfaction. You are dependent on the world for example, for food, for shelter, for love and community, even for respect. But there are things that you need and that the world cannot provide. Things that only you can give yourself. These are what Maslow called the meta needs. To give you an analogy, think of a seed. Now you can provide the basic ingredients to a seed, you can sow it in a fertile land, give it water and sunlight, but what you cannot do is that you cannot grow it with your own hands or turn it into a tree by any kind of external effort. There is already some innate intelligence in the seed that knows how to become a tree when the basic nourishment is there. You don't know how to turn the seed into a tree, only the seed knows. Your work is therefore only to provide the basic ingredients and the seed will naturally turn into whatever kind of tree it was natural for it to become. Just like that, the basic human needs are supportive in function. They only work to provide all the necessary support the basic psychological nourishment. But then, the individual has to dive into his own innate intelligence to grow in a direction that is naturally pulled to grow. The development of the individual is then driven from inside. Let's explore then what these meta-needs are. The meta-needs Usually, when the person is basically gratified, that is, his basic needs are fulfilled, he is considered psychologically sane. But Maslow discovered that while such an individual is mentally healthy and stable, his development does not cease. His growth is not directed anymore 
towards self-satisfaction, towards preserving, protecting and defending, but towards self-enlargement, towards self-expression, towards excitement, adventure, exploration and creativity. This need naturally emerges in basically satisfied individuals. It is not enforced by society or something that is exclusive to certain kinds of people. This is a very human need. The first of these meta needs is called the need for self-actualization. To self-actualize means to materialize, to actualize, to become yourself. To tap into your own potential, to explore your own capacities and to realize your own highest possibilities. It is a need to devote your life to something that is very precious to you, something that you feel you are called to do. Unlike the basic needs, however, which are common to everyone, the process of self-actualization is different for different people because every individual is different in temperament, in likes and dislikes, in capacities, in strengths and weaknesses. Development at this point, therefore, is determined solely from within. You can't learn how to be yourself from a book, from your parents or from this or that person. The process of self-actualization is therefore intrinsically driven, self-directed and autonomous. Every person has some capacities which they are usually afraid to reveal, which they are normally not even conscious of. In the process of self-actualization, all these inhibitions are gradually peeled off the person learns to become more comfortable in his own skin, with his own talents, with his own style, with his own being. He learns to fearlessly radiate his own uniqueness through his actions. He lets his self, his real self, to emerge. At this stage of psychological development, human beings live a very meaningful life. Their life is dedicated to a mission that is close to their heart and which they gradually discovered by following and trusting their own intuition. Whether it's the scientist trying to discover some truth, the pianist trying to compose the most beautiful music, a politician trying to serve his country, or an athlete trying to master his sport, they're all devoted to their craft to the point of complete self-forgetfulness. This sense of worship to a cause, this sense of dedication, surrender and devotion to a purpose that is bigger than oneself, this sense of being fully oneself, being fully expressive of one's highest possibilities is one of the highest need in human beings. This is the need to self-actualize. The second and the last of these meta-needs is no doubt the highest of all and also interestingly the least understood. Maslow's earlier work did not mention this need but he later confessed that this has to be the highest although he was skeptical of his own understanding of this need. This final need functions in a strange way. It emerges in anyone at any stage of human development. It doesn't seem to follow any identified pattern and is still not known why it arrives earlier in some people and late in others. This is the need for self-transcendence, a need for what is otherwise known as spiritual enlightenment, nirvana, moksha, the truth, God and so on. Maslow found that the fulfillment of this need leads to the highest forms of psychological fulfillment the highest degree of humanness, the deepest and the most profound human beings. Human beings in whom this need is fulfilled become saintly. Maslow remarked that whenever he studied such people, he couldn't help but think, now this is a great man. Human beings at this stage of psychological development do not perceive reality in the usual sense. Their whole perception has altered and their experience of life becomes unitive. That is, there is no distinction or division between the experience of themselves and that of the world. They only experience one unitive, undivided reality. Note that this need to self-transcend is not something supernatural. This is also a very human need. It cannot therefore result from any kind of indoctrination or any other form of extrinsic motivation. It is something intrinsic that somehow manifests and the realization of which is carried out by the individual by listening to his own inner voices. The study of this state of psychological development and the path that leads to the state is actually one of the chief goals of Profundus of this podcast, so I will not dive deeper into it in this episode. The goal of this particular episode 
is to make you aware of what is possible for human beings based on what is scientifically known. Now that we have come so far, let's try to finally explore how the human experience changes for self-actualizers and self-transcenders, that is, the human beings who have their meta-needs fulfilled. What is human nature at its best like? Here are some changes that psychologically fulfill people's experience. Superior quality of perception Human perception at the advanced stages of psychological development is radically different. Such individuals, for instance, are able to see things as they are. Now this might not sound radically different, but it is. This is actually the ability to be mindful that is taught as a spiritual technique and that I myself talked about in an episode. In truth, mindfulness is no technique. It is actually a very natural result of being a psychologically fulfilled human being. Such individuals tend to see, to hear, to taste more than ordinary people because they are naturally effortlessly more present in their experiences. Also, to see things as they are implies that there is no interpreting, interfering and muddling of perception. That is, your perception is naturally unbiased. You do not see a woman and see it as a sexual object. You just see a woman. Increased spontaneity There is an increased sense of surrender, of flowing with life, rather than controlling it. This makes such individuals very adaptable and flexible to the changing environments. Such individuals are not hiding behind masks or defenses, so it is easier for them to be self-expressive and spontaneous. Higher frequency of peak experiences Human beings at such stage of psychological development frequently tend to undergo blissful, ecstatic and profound experiences. They also tend to experience flow states more often, which I talked about in the 10th episode. Greatly increase creativity Such people tend to be the most creative of all. This is also the reason why increasing psychological health is also known to cause an overall increase in creativity. Increase autonomy Human beings at such stages are self-driven. They are dancing to their own rhythm. They are not following the values of their culture or religion. Their behavior is not extrinsically driven. They are completely autonomous. Increased detachment and desire for privacy. Such people have discovered their own individual expression, their own meaning, their own mission. Their individuality is not any more dependent on other people's validation, so they are naturally more comfortable with solitude. Increased identification with the human species. Human beings at such stages are more fully human. They naturally think and feel more strongly about the whole human species, the bigger picture, rather than the whims and desires of their own small community. Okay, so these were some of the major changes in behavior that are observed in self-actualizers and self-transcenders. Now the reason I talked about these traits is not to make you feel inferior, but to make you feel hopeful. Hopeful about the potential that is available for you as a human being. You see, a lot of people around us are not living their lives fully. As a result, their psychological growth has been crippled and collectively, what these people end up reflecting is a very limited image of human nature. They are like the birds that have stopped singing, the lions that have stopped roaring. The younger generation then looks up to these psychologically stunted adults and gets confusing distorted impressions of human potential. It's not the fault of anyone though, it's just something that happens in our world. This is in fact one of the reasons for presenting you with this blueprint of human growth which you can use as a guide for your own psychological development. The important thing to understand here is that you need to be self-aware and sensitive to your needs. For example, if there is a deep need that is present in you to expand your horizons in any particular way, it could be the need to travel around the globe, to be more adventurous, to devote your life to a cause that you feel very connected to, to start your own business, to write your own book, to develop your natural talents and become the best in the world, or even to transcend the self and become enlightened, and that for some reason you do not cater to these needs, and deny, suppress or ignore them, then you are going to suffer immensely. All suffering is therefore just a reminder 
that you are somehow selling yourself short, that you are not doing with your life what you are certainly capable of doing. Alright, so this was all for today. If you have any questions or anything to say, feel free to comment in the comment section. We'll mail again soon. Also, for those of you who are not aware, the subtitled version of these episodes are available on Instagram at profundus.n. So feel free to follow me there if you prefer that instead of the audio version. Alright, so thank you for listening to Profundus. I'm Rajat, your host, signing off.